way type of room. All right? So, with that being said, thank y'all for coming out. <laughs> Appreciate you. I'm leaving now. Y'all got it. Hey, oh, really? <laughs> no, I'm not in trouble then getting out. Yeah. Yeah. But before you leave, um, I'm not asking. Matt, yeah. who is with Daniel Defense, yeah. is here, and uh, Daniel Defense sponsored this whole right. game today. So. Also, right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank And I, I want to welcome all of you too. I'm Ken. I'm one of the owners here at Stoddard's, and uh, we're thrilled to have all you guys here. Thanks, man. Thanks, it's a beautiful nice. place, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Right, yeah. So beautiful. I didn't know this was here. Since I live in it. Ken started off that way. I know it's gonna sound real cheesy and all of that, but y'all got to do it. Everybody, go around explaining who you are, especially y'all in this area, who you are, what you do, all that other good stuff. We know each other in this room, but <coughs> the bajillion people that's gonna see it may not. Yeah. All right. So. I think Argo should start. Of course, okay. right? <laughs> Drop this person in the damn room. Alphabetical, man. man. <laughs> so, it's all Asian. No, right, all right, right, right. You choose the big dude you go after. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, Argo J started off on YouTube. Uh, been shooting guns for I don't know how long. Can't even remember building guns, shooting guns, and uh, just glad to be here with everybody. So. Don't clap the seed yet. Alright, now. Hey y'all, I'm Steph. Um, some of y'all know me as S. I started off shooting. I was on the Springfield United States program, and then I also did stuff with the NRA Carry Guard. And then after, other than that, I just try and shoot. People take pictures and videos with me while I shoot. That's about it. <laughs> I thought you said you just shoot people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Unless, exactly. Right. Unless right. it's there. Uh, good morning. My name is Tom Trump. I'm an artist uh, from West Philadelphia. And um, I don't really want to run my stats down, but um, I'm definitely here to represent my community and people who come from where I come from and who look like I look and uh, get some valuable information and hopefully share perspective. From a place many of you may have never been or think about sometimes, so that's why I'm here. Awesome. Uh, my name is Zeke Stout. I am the executive vice president of uh, Firearms Technology School. Got to start in the podcast and YouTube arena on the gun side. Uh, brother in law sitting right there, Brandon, helped me out with a lot of getting that stuff up and running. <coughs> this guy, too, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I've been shooting for a few years now. <coughs> Grew up around guns, but wasn't really a gun guy until probably six, seven years ago. And it kind of all changed. <coughs> Rob, uh, I've been in the industry 20 uh, something years and uh, mostly teach, communicate, educate and uh, grew up in Jersey, spent some time down here in the South, uh, actually finished high school about 30 miles from here, and uh, spent a lot of time dealing with people who are new to guns, and a lot of people who have been in the industry forever, and one of my big passions is that middle ground. Uh, not people who are pro-gun, not people who are anti-gun, but how do we have a conversation that helps people that haven't made up their minds understand the perspective of the pro-gun without pounding on a podium and sort of preaching to the choir. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, John Hickok started a uh, YouTube channel with my dad about 2008, something like that, and uh, you know been doing that full time for uh, uh, since about 2012. And I guess that's my only claim to fame in the gun world is a YouTube channel. <laughs> hey, how you doing, George Enriquez? Um, I'm, the, I'm the state manager for U.S. Law Shield. Okay, I came down, been working with Law Shield for about a year and a half. Did 22 years in music, still own recording studios. And when we saw the opportunity to embrace our community and also my new community and bring them together, this was a no-brainer for me to be here. So we're here, and um, hopefully at some point I can share my story with you guys. You know, I'm, I'm one of these people that basically in the 20 years of being in music, I got into a situation that I got shot three times, and when I returned fire 36 days later, I'm the one that's sitting in trial. But we'll talk about that at some other point. So can I interrupt for just one second? Sir. You guys sponsored breakfast this morning, and yes. I was remiss for not thanking you for that. So okay, so, uh, yeah. awesome. <clears throat> well, thank you. <coughs> you guys need the bagels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brandon Bond. I'm a tattoo artist here in Atlanta. I own a studio called All or Nothing Tattoo in Smyrna, right up the street from Glock. We are Glock people at our studio. 
this guy's my firearms instructor, this guy's my brother-in-law, this guy's my brother, and uh, a lot of you guys are my friends. And I hope, you know, to make more friends today. Uh, Tesma Jew at National Shooting Sports Foundation. I am the manager for inclusion and outreach. So thanks for having me here today. Awesome. I'm Hank Strange. I have a YouTube channel. I consider myself an artist, like a storyteller, but I'm into guns. So I started my channel kind of to show my journey, expose it to everyone. You know, the learning process of guns and that whole thing. I've been doing it for about five years. So I think Matt Maj went after NRA. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so thanks for having me. Okay. Um, my name's Maj. I just bring people together. That's <laughs> it. Um, so the questions are going to be, very, again, very difficult. So we're going to start with a hard one. Is the gun community racist? Go. Yes and no. Yeah, no. yeah. I think <laughs> I think to 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 ask a question like is a whole community racist? It's, it's not a fair question. Are there people inside of any community that's racist? Right. Absolutely. Right. You know, I think to me, I think everyone has a little bit of racism in them. Whoa. You know. Right. So what we're striving to do is to understand ourselves and other people better. <laughs> But I think in the gun community specifically, most people I find are not. Right. But like anywhere else in, in life and society, there's some people that are racist. Why, why, why has that been the permeating stereotype or myth, y'all think? Movies, yeah. media. <laughs> I yeah. guess that um, when I moved to Florida about 18 months ago, and I went in, you know, I guess that's considered the South, right? And I went in from New York City to go to these gun stores. I didn't have all the nice time when I went into the gun store. From the jump, the minute I walked into the door, it was like a little standoffish. But once I started understanding and learning a lot more about firearms, we were able to have a conversation with anybody. And I think that at that point, if you could meet on common ground that you're talking about firearms, I don't think people are looking at colors, they're just looking at what you're talking about. Gun so I, I think that, kind of combining what Hank said, hits to some realities that, that have to be thrown out on the table, which is we're a subculture of a community of Americans, let's just say, in this room, right? But I travel the world too, and racism exists. Kind of like I said, everybody's got a little bit of that. Everybody's got a little standoffishness. And I, I can walk into a gun shop that I've never been in before, and it isn't as true, right? And I think like NSSF and outreach programs and first shots and a lot of the things the community has done over the last decade has changed this. But the average person walking into a gun shop 15 years ago if the person didn't know you behind the counter, they would be standoffish, right? right? It's just the nature of, of kind of that part of the community, right? Security, awareness, who are these people, what's going on? So if you look different, it's easier in any community to feel like that's why. But I just, I think that the gun community itself is pretty guarded. It's generally conservative. And even, and, I, and conservative, not capital C political, right? It's generally reserved people that want to control themselves, they're aware of their surroundings, things like that. So I think that that, that gets brought into this pre-existing condition of underlying racism, not in a nefarious way, but just uncomfortable with other people that aren't your people. And you, and Pete, and that's part of the reason why, you know, for my demographic, that's why we run into that. That's why we run into old dude behind the counter, he, nah, I don't really rock with him. But I don't need it. No, but look, right. but here's the thing though. I'm honestly, I believe that the Second Amendment community, gun community, in my opinion, does not do enough to bridge that gap. No, they don't. They okay. don't. Because it becomes, instead of going, hey, the reason why I'm looking at you this way is because, you know, one, your, your level of ignorance about the actual information is what's pissing me off. Not, there's no explanation there. Right. You know what I'm saying? And we let that permeate. And then, and that's you. Right, and then that's why we keep losing. The numbers is the numbers. You know what I'm saying? Y'all might have different experiences and all of that, you know what I'm saying? But to me, I, I remember my first time going into a gun store. And I literally remember the dude saying, what you want, a Desert Eagle? <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? But you said Let, yes. Right. To <laughs> <what I'm> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that, the, the, the vibe behind that was like, not only is it like, like damn, even if you're having a bad day, you know what I'm saying? Now it, it may not be Desert, it might be Draco. Yeah, that's and pretty much what it is nowadays. Right. That's more high point, you know what I mean? Right. But, yeah. like, the reality is, like, in Wisconsin, especially in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, where, I, where I live, it, it, it's a reality. We have a, I work at a gun store, but our gun store is probably the only, one of the only ones in the city who does not subscribe to that, yeah. that 
that method of treatment. But there's one that's literally right around the corner from us. If you walk in right now, Rob, if Rob walks in, Rob will get service, he'll get a gun, walk out. Right, right, right. Right. I'll walk in, and the first thing they ask me is to have a concealed carry permit. Mm -hmm. But he will not service me unless I show him a concealed carry permit. It's not required by the state to show a concealed carry permit or to have a concealed carry permit to purchase a firearm. But he does this to people of color all day long. All day long. And we're gonna actually expose this dude, but in the video. Yeah, right. in, in the in the movie. So that's an actual that's an actual thing. I mean I think a lot of times racism has to do with fear. Mm -hmm. Right? So it depends where you come from. I grew up in New York and I grew up in Far Rockaway. And the, at the time that I grew up in Far Rockaway, if you saw a white guy there, if Rob came in, they'd be like, What's this guy doing here? You know, I went to high school and Fort Rockaway. Well, yeah, I grew up in Far Rockaway. In Far Rockaway, they would have said, "What's the white boy?" Yeah, when when, when I lived there in the '80s, in the part of Far Rockaway I oh, lived 80s, in, I yeah, that was a lot of yeah. <laughs> yeah the gentrification <laughs> is different now. But I mean, can yeah. I just interject real quick? Sure. He asked a real question, right? Mm -hmm. And where I'm sitting at, he started first and basically was like, "No, there's no racism," mm -hmm. and then everybody kind of gave stories of racism, mm -hmm. right? So why couldn't this whole room say? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, well, I think I said there is racism. No, but it was all these remixes. Oh, yeah, like this and this, that. And mm -hmm. he came with, with his yeah. story. He worked there. Right. But just, just use it yeah. real quick. I'm he mm -hmm. worked there. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's some, sometimes it's easy as, yes, it is. Yeah. That doesn't mean all of y'all are racist. That right. doesn't mean but right. perception is reality. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you talking about the 80s in 4Rock. Mm -hmm. It's 2017. In 4Rock, you know little black boys looking at him crazy when he comes through Far Rock. Mm -hmm. If anything, they looking at him like he might be powerful because of the suit or the police. But mm -hmm. they not looking like, oh, we're not going to serve him. But we don't, we don't deal with that in our community. You know what I mean? There's no segregation as far as your race. Right. Mm -hmm. It's about your money. It's about what you offer. That's the big misconception. So when he asks, is it racism? Y'all all giving examples of racism. He did. Y'all all, everybody, oh, yeah, well, when I walk in here, when I walk in there, no, it's yes. Right. right. Doesn't mean everybody hates a particular race or a particular, you know, racism is just about race and prejudices. But they got to start with keeping it the fuck real. Like all of these movies and oh, all everybody, I, yeah, I hear all that. But he's told you in Milwaukee, a place that I would think was more white people. If they going to Milwaukee, you got to imagine what they going in type of places where I was at yesterday, or where I'm going tomorrow, or a place where you be at. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, where you far rock, where you talking about now? Far rock is 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 is, is, is a war zone right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was doing in the eighties, but right now it's a little war zone. Well, in the eighties there was crack, so it was a war zone then. War zone, yeah, it's war zone. It's, it's Vietnam over there right now. Yeah. So, and they don't give a fuck about what color you are. But I just think from the first question, because if we sit here and do all these remixes and all the all the all, all great experiences, we're gonna be here for twenty hours. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, yo, let's keep it real, because that's how you get to the solution or the answer. Mm -hmm. It does start with the individual because somebody can leave here today and say, oh, wow, that one guy made me change my mind. Sometimes it's one, you can see one thing where I might be, well, damn, I was wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, because we all, like you said, everybody has a little bit of something in it, but it doesn't have to be hateful, though. And, and you know, you can be skeptical, you can be protected, right? But you don't have to be hateful. And to that point, I think what happens a lot of times in, in our experiences where I'm from, I, I just walk in these different lines because I could. Me, I, I could go, I, I, I really see what you actually mean, but you pretend it like, what's the line? Don't stop pretending you uh, racism is patriotism. Mm -hmm. So that vibe is what, it, you know, in urban communities, even if you white. If we from North Philly, he grew up the same way that I grew up, that vibe is going to, he understands that vibe, so we get hit with that from the door. But then there's very convenient buffers to explain it away. In that sense, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying to y'all, these are the things sometimes you, that's why that explanation has to be there. Hey, the reason why I'm saying this, there is no explanation for, yo, my man, why are you asking me for my concealed carry? Mm -hmm. Just actually, I actually know the law. Mm -hmm. So I know that the thing that you're doing, Brandon walked through there, it, it might, well, Brandon gave a text. We don't have a friend. No, that <laughs> no, <laughs> ain't see if it was that level of. No, so you said, said right, right. Oh, wait. He's clear, he's right here. So right. that's what we do with real life right. understanding, not. What we want it to be. Right. No, deal with the real shit. Right. No, with his tattoos, he's not looking at the right. same as me with my tattoos. Right. He's not. And right. why? Right. Not the makeup shit. Not the right. all the humidity between all, right. all the uniforms. Right. That shit won't. Uh. So, what do you think is the, the root of it? I mean, I, I was going to say that I think it's fear. What do you think is the root of, of what people feel about like this guy going into the store in Milwaukee 
and asking everyone for you know for their concealed carry permit. What do you think is the root of that? There's no words for it, but I mean, yeah. we, we gotta stop dressing it up. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yo, what a nice experience from eliminating yeah. thousands of bad experiences. But I do think there's a, there's a huge difference between hate and fear. Mm -hmm. Right? To me. I mean, but when you hate me or you scared of me, I ain't really trying to figure out why. You're, I mean, you're from your perspective, but if we're gonna get to how to change it, right? So if, some, if this guy hates, this guy, that, I mean, this place you're talking about, right? Maybe, maybe he does hate people of color. Maybe he hates black people, maybe he hates it. just brown people. I don't know what he hates. But maybe he fears it for who knows what reason, right? But I do think that somewhere in here, if, if we were sitting, if we were all car people, and you say, "Hey, is the, is the automotive industry racist? Is the music industry racist?" I think there's racism on Earth. I think there's racism in America, and as a subculture, I, I think that's something we have to accept. I don't think you put a hat on and say, "Oh, I'm a gun guy now, so I'm not racist because gun." We're all all about Second Amendments for everyone, right? I get it, except we're still people. Well, the question is, is it a person or is it an institution? I believe that it's an institution instilled and it permeates and our experiences are different. Mm -hmm. the, the only reason why I get certain passes, why I don't get that, because I know the difference between where I, when I wear BGM logos and when I don't. Mm -hmm. I, can t I, can, I know it. They go, oh, that's the guy from Black Guns Matter because mm -hmm. the shirt says it. Right. No different than if New War come through and he okay. don't have his hat on. Right. They might handle him, and it's there. It's to me, it's 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 instilled. It's instilled, and it might be a set of a set of you know circumstances mm -hmm. that you don't have to deal with anymore because they go they fanboy you out. <laughs> they go, <laughs> oh, that's Hank Strange, da da da, da. Yeah. and you might not have to run through it. And your mohawk is different now. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'm saying all of those different things are there, and I'm telling you, for me, from my perspective. That's why the Second Amendment community, we at a space now where we're fighting for basic human rights because we're not having that honest conversation about that and we're not calling the situation out and going, yo, you want some bullshit right now. Mm -hmm. The original question though was, is the gun community racist? Flat. And he said no, right. in general. Yeah. Right, yeah. but there is racism. Yeah, are there individuals? Because I, I, I still go through <clears throat> things, you can ask Lola. Right, but I, but, I still but, go through but, things either with individual companies yeah. or individual people, yeah. but a community as a whole, right. no, right? right? Yeah. And then there's that's, levels, that's the there's, right. there's, there's, there's levels of things. And I respect that because right. you're all within the community, but like, right. like he said, like I said earlier, perception is reality. Like he gave the example, which is true, the music industry, in every industry there are people, but y'all gotta look at the leadership in your industry yeah. and the voices in your industry. Right. The leadership in, in, in the music industry aren't coming out saying things that are very insensitive or different things like where you can really be like, Oh, he might be, you know what I'm saying, racist. But like, from the outside looking in, I'm not a part of your community, but I, I would never be like, oh, everybody in there right. is racist. Yeah. Or everybody's you are now. Everybody's, you are now. everybody's so, an uncle Tom. Right. But yo, I mean, we got to keep it the fuck real. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the pe like I don't see how people can't see it. Like, like, certain misconceptions of the hood, there's a lot that's wrong, but it's a lot where I can see somebody be like, well, that's wrong, but I can see why they think that. I'm not unrealistic. I'm okay. I'm not I'm not if the white lady locks her door when I'm walking mm -hmm. by. I ain't tripping cuz I'm like I get it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I, I want my grandma to lock her door. Yeah. Say one of my friends look like you know what I mean? Okay, cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? But certain things is like come on. Like you know what I mean? Right. Like, so like, you're saying like on the outside, outside, on the outside looking in at the community. I'm yes. just trying to understand what you're saying. On the outside looking in in the at looking at the gun community, you feel like the, the, the gun community is racist, right? It could be viewed so that, that way, and that's right. the okay. that's, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I understand. Yeah, I feel like it can be, and I yeah. feel like it definitely is. I feel like when you hear certain things, mm -hmm. certain people from certain places, whatever rings in the head first. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you say, hey, we're going over here. Somebody might say, oh, they got good food over there, or they mm -hmm. got whatever yeah. over there, or we're going over here. Like you know what I mean? Part of the problem oh, is the gun culture is as. This for a long time it's been dominated by country people. People live out in the sticks, you know, and we know how, you know, not to stereotype those people either, but we know how people that are isolated out in the country can be. And that, and, you know, the general perception is when you think of guns in the city, you think of crime, and then we think of guns out in the country, you think of hunters and rednecks, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Real shit. Yeah, and, that's, and that's a perception switch that keeps a lot of people from our neighborhoods from going, okay, I don't, I don't, I fit what they, their perception of the urban firearm is, but I almost don't want to fit that because 
associated with me going to jail. Right. Well, I think a key word that everybody's using is perception. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the question is. Is the perception of the firearms community right. racist? And I think personally, yes. Right. Right. And for example, NRA from the first one I went to the, the big convention where the largest majority of our demographic gathers, four years ago in Houston, I saw two black guys. <coughs> Houston. And it's it's okay. grown. Houston. Right. It's yeah, it's grown. Right. But then when I meet you and you, me and uh, Jay are hanging out at NRA this year, right. I'm watching. Right. And people were walking by doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh my God, what right. is that? They're interacting. Right. To that yeah. person yeah. in their brain, they may they may be thinking, oh, this is really cool, you know. You know, diversity or whatever they're thinking in the brain, but the perception is they're racist. And well, the sad thing is, though, what, what Tone said, and it's real, perception is 100% reality. Yeah, it's reality. You know if, I, yeah. if I feel like that, that's what it is. Yeah, right. You know, if you feel uncomfortable, that's exactly yeah. what it is. But isn't that why we started doing this? I mean, I know that's why I, I, know that's why right. I, I got elected to do this, to be honest with you. Like, I didn't really want to do what I'm doing. But people in my family said, you know, we don't feel like we're represented out there, and you need to do it. Right. And we we elect you. We say you're the person who's going to go out there and expose your life to everyone. So that's why I'm doing it. And and I and I understand where you're coming from. I mean, the big thing that I want to know now that I'm on the inside, right, is like what can we do about it? What what can we do that you think would be valid to fight what you're doing? Well, feeling? I think I think to that point, real quick. In essence. Stop pretending. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The pretense, the pretense of it, I might just be cool enough to laugh in my head, mm -hmm. but I'm still moving forward. Mm -hmm. But there's a thousand people like me that go, oh, I thought it was going to be cool over here. And that perception, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you, that's the reason why there's 40 conservative estimates, mm -hmm. 40, 50 million people that we can get on this side. Mm -hmm. But the, the media push on purpose, and we're not doing a good enough job of you can't just say, like, I did that panel discussion at whatever foundation over the summer, right? Mm -hmm. And it was the diversity panel. Mm -hmm. It was five black people there. Four of us was on the panel. Right. In a room completely with white people. And they're like, right. y'all don't understand that this is not the look. The optics is horrible for this. Right. The optics are horrible. And it, and it got to even not just be optics. You actually have to, if we're going, okay, let's all get together and have this room. Why nobody did this right here for the last... 30 years? Well, that's why we need you, yeah. man. No, because that's, 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 that's where fear yeah. comes in. People are afraid to sit down and have this conversation. And that's what I meant by fear and ignorance. Well, you know, when, when you sit down and have a conversation like this with people who don't look like you, it causes you to look at yourself and reflect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And a lot of times people don't want to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to say, you know what, I am racist. Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't even know it. You right. know, yeah. or like, I do subscribe to that mentality. And I didn't even know it. You know, and, and a lot of times, it's, it's things like this that are, are what's needed. So, you know, why hasn't that happened? Who knows why? Yeah, if I, if I can say something yeah. to that. First, I'll introduce myself. I'm sorry I missed the introductions earlier. My name is M. O'Neill Mitchell, and I'm the director of training uh, for Stoddard's Academy. This is a ninja, literally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also uh, the national training director for the National African American Gun Association, the largest gun association in the world um, for African Americans and people of color. And then I'm also on the board of directors for the NRA, an NRA instructor. So uh, I have a unique perspective. The operative term that we've been using here is perspective because that informs reality, your perception. As the director of the National African American Training, um, I'm sorry, National African American Gun Association, when I first came on board to the organization, it was pretty standard as far as our offerings and our training and what have you. I came to realize just what we're talking about right here. Mm -hmm. That prejudice, racism existed in the organization, throughout the gun community, gun culture, and all the things we're talking about, I had to learn to address. So I created a new members orientation where we talk about these things. To answer your question, what can we do just like the way we address prejudice and ignorance and racism outside of this community, this gun community, is through education, exposure. Those of, us, we, those of us who have been privileged to travel and been exposed to other cultures and what have you, it gives us a greater level of sensitivity and tolerance. But, but Pete, you're talking about stuff 
that my, there's people where I'm from, they never the leave, and, and that's more of it, so that the, the responsibility is more on the gun community. Yes, absolutely. Because so, cause even, yeah. even if they want to, if they want to, if they want to, because like, with all due respect, I never knew it was the African, you know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm, and I'm sure I didn't make a million of you say we never knew, you know what I mean? So it's like the education, like when this brother walked in, with the fire, like you know how many young kids in my community would love. They're not gonna say the white guy born in the, in the, in the gun. They gonna be like, think he the coolest dude in the world. Same thing with you. Once you start talking and y'all knowledge, they gonna be so excited to learn. So the education is definitely the key. It, it, it starts with the young because, sorry to say, people are able. They mind you, made absolutely about everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. With the babies, like he did some work in a very rough school in our community. And he had to tell you, most people with a broken kids or not, they not. And them kids was in there learning, they was embracing it, they was wanting to come in and forcing them to learn other stuff. Talking to people, asking for it, like, y'all got to make yourself available mm -hmm. if you want to. You right. know, it's not mandatory, you know what I mean? But if Which, you want to. Real quick, that's what brings me to the point of what the NSSF is doing. And I kind of like, Tism, I kind of want you to jump in there on that as far as the safety <laughs> initiative, especially dealing with youth, you know, and things like that. So, again, y'all, Tism. Well, the National Shooting Sports Foundation is all about firearm safety, education, responsibility for everybody. You know, on the outside, you know, the firearms community looks like it's like, oh, it's just a bunch of little white guys, and it's not true. <laughs> you know, it's it's not true. Um, and we're, we're we're slowly trying to like you know break that stereotype that you know the firearms community is for everybody. We have programs out there. You know, the first shots program is available to anybody. And Ken's had several of the, the events here at his store. Uh, met with the NAAGA guys yesterday. They're going to try to bring it out to a lot of the different clubs across the country and stuff. But you know, and thanks, Mod, because this is just what we need. We need to like get get the information out there. It's like I didn't know you guys like never met you guys, never met you. Well, yeah. We're friends on Twitter, so thanks, man. I appreciate oh, <laughs> 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 all y'all this place. Yeah. But the more that we can, you know, and we as an industry, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, we are the voice of the firearms industry. So. In my opinion, it is our job to like get that information out there. Right. But if we don't know where all the other organizations mm -hmm. are and they exist, and how to get that information to those who aren't involved in the community, that's where we need your help. How can we get this information out there? How can we let people know that it's not all a bunch of old white guys? There are actually women in it, too, <laughs> right, right. and women I, of color. That, that was going to be that was gonna <laughs> be my next question. How do y'all feel as women, right? So some of Shanine's not here. She, she'd be in a second. How do y'all feel as women? Do y'all feel switching from race to sexism? How do y'all feel about that? Do y'all think it's, is, is it your experiences in it? Do you feel, okay, as, as a gun person, I feel the understanding of guns as a woman, da 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 da. But do I run it, do I more often run into um, the more chest beating mentality or uh, inclusive mentality? For me, for me personally, I feel like it's actually inclusive, but it's kind of in a sense this balance between like oh, I really want you to shoot, but here, let me baby you as well. Mm. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of men are like, oh, I think it's awesome that you shoot, but it's also like, oh, man, that's sexy, that's hot, so it's like you kind of objectify me, mm. you know? Right. Um, and that's that's how I feel, and that's my experience. Lola? Well, and let me introduce myself again, as you did. I'm Lola Strange, wife of Hank and I do the most of the videography in the background for the deal that we She's do. my big job. Um, <laughs> <Sort of. laughs> for me, I think that, um, you know, from the outside looking in, I think that there's a, a lot of different places you can be as a woman in this, in, in this industry, if you want to call it that. There are the ones that, that shoot professionally, and then there are the ones that do like photography for the companies to model their products. So if you're coming into into it, you're and you're trying to figure out where you fit in. I, I guess you. I don't fit in either in either group, per se. For me, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a professional. So that grounds me in what I do. So I don't get caught up in whatever is going on in the industry. For me, I do it for me. It's my personal defense of myself and my children. Mm -hmm. Anyone else may be in my in my space if something were to ever come up. So. And, and then I think also, I mean, I'm a lot older than I look, so the maturity for me is, is also grounds me. So I don't get caught up in any of those things. But I think that, um, is there a lot of sexism in the industry? I'd say, of course. I mean, it's exemplified by 
publishing scene or whatever it goes on out there. And I think that is, again, it's, it's human nature, it's human beings, the interaction between men and women. Right. You know, as you see now that everyone, you know, is by the dust in the uh, news media. Right. It's just what it is. And I think that as human beings, these are things that we can't deny exist. Switch topic. Yeah. Do you mind? Um, I know I'm supposed to be behind the camera, dude. I'm sorry, man. So, <laughs> the camera, the camera so, so my, also is actually a firearm yeah, disruptor as well. So, uh, my name is Edgar Antillona. I run Guns for Everyone, along with, I don't think this guy wants to claim it right now, but uh, Guns for Everyone, which is probably the largest handgun training company in the state of Colorado. One of the things that, and I'm also a filmmaker right now, too, so um, that's the hat that I'm wearing today. Um, but one of the things I keep, I, I, I heard earlier, is that's why we need Maj. What is everybody else gonna do about it? We talk about objectification, what are you gonna do about it? We talk about racism, what the hell are you gonna do about it? Because we sit here and we're just victims. That, that's cute to be a victim. Like it feels good to be a victim because now you feel sorry for me and I got your pity and you pat me on the back and you say I'm cool and, and I feel sorry for you, but what the hell are we gonna do about it? Because Maj, Maj is cool and all, but I mean, he ain't the only guy that, that, that could be doing all this stuff. Right? Like, like he, he's, he's all right. Uh, he's all right. But what is, what is everybody else in this room going to do about it? What are you going to do in your hood? But, what? You know, I think I think too that sometimes things like this are what are, what are needed to kick people in the ass and get them started. You know what I'm saying? We may all feel like that, you know, at home, you know, and then coming to some place like this gives a, gives some people that little boost that they needed to get off their ass mm -hmm. and to become active. Right. You know, we all are activists in a way. Right. You know what I mean? But it's how you you, you carry about. It's how you go about. <laughs> What you do and what you believe in, like uh, like we said, it, it, it's real. And, and to speak to the women, like it, that was a very real thing because, as a dude in the industry, we all know this. We all hear this. When you see a when you see a girl or a woman shoot, first thing you think is shit. Got money or she a shooter. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's the first thing that comes up. Why should it ever come up like that? Right. You know, but it is. It does. And we can't. And it just it is what it is. Right. You know what I mean? But so and I think before we switch subjects yeah. too. I, mean, I don't want to sound like a shameless toy for the school, but with the school, uh, at SDI we have a curriculum that's based on firearms. And just like everything else in the firearms industry, we get blasted daily. Oh, well, this is BS. Well, this curriculum sucks. If we sit back and go, no, it's good, we're good, then we'll never progress. We'll never get better. So anytime you have a problem, the, the first step to fixing it is to admit, yes, it's broken, to your point. You know, not dance around it and make the problems seem pretty because we're uncomfortable. There's issues, they're obviously there. So once we embrace that and start start going forward with it, it's always be an event. <clears throat> Growing up in Nashville, it's you know, it's a good mix of, of, of diversity there. But my high school had three black people in the whole school. And I go to college to play basketball, all of a sudden I'm the only black guy on the team. <laughs> and it was a night and day difference. Well, when somebody called me out and said something about being racist, what did I say? I have lots of black friends. Stand I didn't know that was wrong. I didn't understand. But then they explained it to me, and they said, you're wrong, that's broken. And the only way for me to fix it was go, gosh, that, that was bad. I shouldn't have said that. And now I understand. So now we're going to switch the topic to something that's going to make everybody uncomfortable, per se, especially fire. Yeah. So what you said, excuse me myself, but what we're doing, me and my team is doing, you can't get it with us. Because for so long, we just assume, just like we feel like maybe it's not, I'm not saying y'all specifically, but the community feels so many ways about us. I'm here, kind of like, I've already <coughs> learned so much and changed so many different things. You know what I'm saying? Like, now it's my responsibility to go back to my community and tell them about this brother's program and this program in this school. So that's what we that's what we want. We hear it, right? I don't get up at 10 o'clock in the morning. You know, I miss money. You know, different things. We sacrificing. People, like, all the so my homies don't come here. They would say, for what? But I'm like, we've been doing that for so long. I yeah. keep saying, for what? You know, I don't know, thank for us, thank for us. Like, if, I, if we get one thing out of here, if I get one person in this class, you know what I'm saying? That's what we, that's what we doing. I, and I feel like that's a credit to everybody. Even if there's somebody in here who is a racist, they taking a step to at least hear people. That, that's, that's what we doing, we getting active. Right. Cause I'm sure for Saturday, it's not, people will be a lot of places right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things people be doing. So people taking the first step, and being here, he's getting a lot of backlash. I don't know if y'all know, 
Philadelphia is a very, 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 very dangerous city. And just as many, like you say, people, mind is cool, mind is cool. There's a lot of people who feel like he's selling out. A lot of people who feel like he's short. There's a lot of people who don't even like me posting him on Instagram. Like, he's one of the, like, yeah. the term, y'all, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he's fighting so hard to educate from the schools. And he's going places people in his world with dare go. What are talking about? Dare go to try to educate. So he's trying to pull different people in. Is that the he, he takes me to Maxis. I don't care where you go. Right. But, you know, that's, that's the thing. I mean, even to piggyback on what you're saying, that's the reason why I said we need people like Maj. And I'll tell you why. At NRA, I went to... Um, there was a panel that went on at the NRA. I'm not trying to bring anyone down in that panel, but I went there, and there were a lot of people that were my fans that were in the room to see the panel, including me, and they kept asking me, how can you get on this panel? My answer to that is, I don't want people to give me shit like that, because see, that doesn't mean anything to me. But for, for a panel to go, you know what, we should get a black guy on here, and, then they, and that's why they put me on there, I don't believe in it. I would rather, like, seeing that, from outsiders, right. they go, oh. So before the, cause okay, you're not using your phone for smart stuff, you right. play video games, right. but visually, I'm cool with that for a second. Then when, when I'm the person, usually, I'm usually one of those people on that panel. And then I go, your model for the, to the people that bring me there, right. your model for this panel is wrong, and here's why. Yeah. But, you know yeah, but here's my problem with it. First of all, you weren't on the panel. That would have been, it would have been right awesome. Now, right. Yeah, it would have been awesome to see you on the panel, but you weren't there. Right. And I think that we already have that kind of stuff. And when we make someone a token, you yeah. look at them as a token. Yeah. He's, he's fighting his way in. He's dealing with a lot of adversity to be here. That means a lot more to me. I'm not trying to knock someone who is a token. You know, I'm not that kind of person. But what I'm saying to you, I think that means more to me. Right. And I think it's going to mean more to a lot of people out there to see that there's people who actually worked and fought their way up and they made this thing happen. Right. And someone didn't hand it to them. Right. And who do you see doing this? You see the guy who had to fight his way in doing it. And you don't see the person who's the token doing this. Something kind of stuff. that you said when you introduced yourself, you're like, I bring people together. Right. right? And I think that's a huge thing too. Not only being like, look, I made it, but look at all the other people that can make it with me that right. I brought up and I right. brought together, right? right? Strength in numbers, right. Yeah. right? If you wanna make an impact, you don't stand there on the corner by yourself and shout things out. You get everybody together right. and you're like, look, this is what's going on. Let's make a difference. These are a lot of the people who have an issue with it. Right. right. The, what you said is really important. I wasn't on that panel either. Right, and, and <laughs> should have been. Right, right. I should have been. Yeah. But there is a thing. Like, uh, let's just let, let's say this. You said that you were the voice of the industry. Right? NSSF is the voice of the industry, and and I believe that. But not the community. And I'm. I've, we talked about this, uh, Jennifer Pierce. I've talked with you guys I, over the last couple of years. I think NSSF is speaking out more mm. to people outside of the industry. Right. NSSF's done a great job inside the industry. The very first people I interacted with. NSSF people, the Sportsman's Team Challenge back in the 90s, right, in the industry. The NRA has not done a good job at this, right? And, and as the voice of the community that a lot of people either listen to or that gets quoted, they've not done a good job at this. Now, when you look at the NRA, less than 6% of gun owners in America are members of the NRA. It's a small fraction of gun owners. And the NRA does a really good job of pandering to that extremist niche that will pay money and will support the NRA, and that's kind of their job, right. right? Is to focus on, well, that guy over there and that guy over there are paying us money, let's tell them what they want to hear, let's keep talking to them and let's get their money. And we, don't, we know that we're not gonna have 90 plus percent of gun owners anyway, so forget about the other percentage of the country that isn't even a gun owner, or isn't even active in the community, or isn't even trying to be part of it. So I think that is something that we all need to acknowledge and change and, and in terms of where is the voice. Right, because I get that question all the sure. time. Yo, mm -hmm. how come, so the NRA paying you, right? No. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you was on their show, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but, well, they don't see what you're doing. And then it's the trick bag for me because then it becomes, for me and my position, it's like I know that you associate the NRA because you're on the outside looking yeah. You associate that with that. And if they run for the civil or the legal part of it, right? I can't almost, I can say that, but then that person becomes, oh, well, the NRA, then the gun community and the culture is racist. 
Because when I, when I present that stat to them, they go, well, yeah, that's why. They call them to sell out mods because they associate. But it's not. It, 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 there's a financial and power right. and position that has nothing to do with race. Right. It has to do with where am I getting my money? Right. Where do I get my support? Right. And it just so happens that it is this, this cliche. You said something earlier about for so long, the industry's been this like country folk kind of thing, right? right? Yep. But that is, that is a perception created by the NRA to pander to the country folk that are paying the money. That's right. Because the, the, the gun industry, Beretta, is 500 years old, right? right? That, that's not a bunch of white crackers into whatever Alabama, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's, that's Beretta. That's like more than perception, Glock. though. You right. drive out the country and talk to people and see who's into guns versus people. But so you're going to tell me that you can't go into the hood and, and sit down with a bunch of guys that may or may not have legally, may or may not have been through training, may or may not be NRA. But they got guns. There's guns all over the place. I grew up in New Jersey. There's guns all over the place. Right? New York. I don't care where you guys are. Don't they? There's as many guns in, in the projects in Nashville as there were up in Gallatin where I live. It's a different community. We just don't it's realize that there's a legal route to that. No, I, think, I, think, I, think, I, I don't think, I think a lot of us don't <clears throat> recognize that, but I think a lot of us are turned off by some of those same reasons. But there's it's like, why, why illegal guns in the country? But here's the thing. As there are in the city. For me, so <laughs> y'all got, yeah, the, that's y'all got the information, that's the fact. But the, the reality is, I think, when you run up against that, I'm associated, their marketing is working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the marketing goes, I'm the NRA, even when the media tags them, NRA gun gun gun. You're still perception. You're associating guns with NRA, and if they're messed up, I got the guns right there already. So why do I need them? Yeah, you feel what I'm saying. So I'll and see. with that being the case, now is the uncomfortable part. You have the set to say, yeah, that's some bullshit. The general public in our industry and community won't make that statement. Because a lot of people in this industry will look around and see who's in the room before they say, hey, William Javier is probably on the stage as well. Don't you think? He needs to retire. But they won't say it out loud. Right, right. I'm going to send him, when PD10 launches, I'm going to send him gun 1871 as retirement. Wait, wait, now, hey, let me, let me. That's fun. But look, here's the thing, though. Now, let me, let me devil's advocate If they're the, hey, and if the other side, the anti-gun side, says, okay, all of their support is leaving, they wounded. Take them out. Who do we replace them with? I don't know. But oh, hold on. Why, don't, don't, why do we even have to replace them? Right. I don't think we have to replace Improved. anything. Improved. I think we just have to show that there's people like us. Right. That's that's what it is. Um, for me, coming to America, the I'm, movie? I, I've always no, I've always <laughs> been <laughs> guns, right? But I'm not, I'm not a, I wasn't born in America. So coming, coming here to America, for me, I got into guns because of people like Tupac. That's the generation I grew up in. And I saw him saying, this is my right. Right. You're trying to take this away from me and put me in prison and stuff like that. And I still believe that. When, when I got my wife into guns, she told me, and she met me in New York City, so I had guns. Right. It was all illegal. Right. Right? And that's why we moved the hell out of there. So when I actually got her into it, we were living in Florida. And she finally got into it. She said she grew up in Maryland. She said to me, you know, I always thought that guns were just for the bad guys. Yeah. So the thing is, is that we have to change that. Right. We have to change that because I think in America, most of us believe in guns. Yeah. And I know in the black community, we believe in guns. Yeah. <laughs> what we have to do, to me, it means freedom. That's what it means. This is a freedom that I have. And I'm not giving it up. Right. And, and the reason why I want it, like I said, I'm an artist. I want to be free. I don't want people to tell me how to look and how to talk and all of that. The whole time I've been in this thing, people tell me, get rid of the mohawk, wear a suit, talk like this. I already talk pretty nerdy, you know. But the thing is, is that people realize that I'm not, I wasn't, you know, I'm not what you would put in the category of being like a black American or whatever. I'm from the Caribbean. We have a similar experience. But I'm not the same thing. But people, so people always try to tell you yeah. what to be, right. and I, I don't, I don't want that. I want to make my own category and my own platform. So that's that's what I like about him, and that's what I'm here. Right into. Here's the thing: we're gonna to switch the topic to something that's gonna make some of us very comfortable, mm-hmm. some of us very uncomfortable. Okay. We freedom. Mm-hmm. Now, if you 4473, fuck with we, so you can't. 
can't exercise the oh, it's too much freedom, can't choose yeah. which Well, you, you can't say it. You can't say it. But that's bullshit. That's taking away people's right to do, you know, to be free. So know what they want to do. So with that being the question, how can we push back to make sure that those both of those freedoms that you choose to participate in mm -hmm. are secure? Because now what it looks like, especially as the urban demographic, because that the reality is more of our demographic is going gun, lawful firearms ownership, right. this is my right second amendment, da 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 da. They doubling down on them. Hawaii, sending right. letters out. If you got the or taking guns, yeah, send bring that bring that right over to it. We have to. I, are we having that conversation? Sure. Hold on. I, I, I've lived in Colorado most of the last twenty years. Yeah. I was a sheriff's deputy in San Miguel County, where the sheriff, libertarian sheriff, he wrote the book in like ninety two about how the war on drugs is bullshit and all that. To tell you right, it's been de facto legal forever. All right, and and there's not many black people there. Right. This is not just an urban right. black thing. Right. Colorado, obviously, it's legal now. So I look at it like this, like, okay, 15 years ago, if I go to Amsterdam, it's legal there. I want to go into a shop and I smoke a joint, whatever, and I come back to the U.S., does that mean I'm, I have to fill out a 4473 and say, oh, I illegally use it? No, because it was legal there. Well, now it's legal in Colorado, except Colorado is in the U.S., and it's illegal in the U.S., and I'm so confused, I don't know what to do. And I think the government's confused, I think the ATF's yeah. confused, I know the gun community is confused, right? So it puts people in this position of, Mine puts it in, and believe me, I come from like the background. My dad was a, a undercover narcotics cop in Jersey. I grew up with the you know guns and, and drugs with these two different things, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I've matured. I understand right. that there there is it's about freedom, right? There are these freedom issues. So I don't care if it's abortion, if it's who you marry, if it's who you have sex with. If you want a gun for protection, but you're doing something that's legal, but it's illegal at the same time, it gets easier. <coughs> and what's the easy choice? The easy choice is. I'm just not. I'm not. I'm gonna go buy the gun from that yeah. guy because he'll sell it to me, yeah. right? Or I have the gun my grandfather gave me. I was just in France, standing in a guy's house, his grandfather's house, his old farmhouse, and he pulled his gun out from under his bed. And he's like, "Hey, check this out." And I'm like, "I didn't even think that was legal here." Oh, it's not legal, but I promise yeah. you, there's there's 300 of them within, right. and these, these is like white French guys, right. right? And they all have guns. They're illegal. They're dealing with exactly the same thing that a guy in the projects in. Nashville is dealing with where, oh yeah, I got a gun. Why? Protection. If somebody kicks that door in, I want to be able to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm all about, personal defense education, right? I don't care if you're using a bat or a gun. I, I'm wearing a medical kit, right? When I get on that plane, I'm wearing a medical kit, self-defense. So this education piece of why do you have the gun? If somebody out in the country thinks that all the black guys in the city that have guns have them so they can steal your car, they're just ignorant, right? Comes right back to that, education. They have guns to protect themselves. Well, they're selling drugs. They need to protect themselves. Well, I don't. That's this is such an ignorant judgment, right? Right. Maybe it's just like in their community, because bad guys don't want to take. They're out there working, making money. Someone wants to take something from them. The, the, the problem I think in America is we have too many damn laws. I think a lot of gun guys would agree. Amen. That. That's the solution to that. Why the hell is there a law about that? Why? There shouldn't be a law about that. It shouldn't be illegal. That's the solution to it. So are we, all, changing are we saying that we are all willing from our respective circles to now organize politically in that sense to make sure that we're informing our demographics or our lanes of people to say, yo, this is this particular politician that is trying to steal your freedom. Mm -hmm. I think that's what happens. I think what happens a lot of times, hey, what's up, Shanine? Y'all know Shanine. <laughs> I think what happens a lot of times is we know this stuff, but we don't advocate in our lane to say, nah, this is not right for these reasons. Yeah. And for me, as, as y'all are coming here today, in my mind, it's like, yo, make sure that now we are all active politically in that sense in whatever room that you're in to make those people then become politically active. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. Uh, that's the point that I was driving to earlier is when I came on board with um, the National African American Gun Association, it was just conventional firearms training, right. you know, standard, right. you know, marksmanship, you know, safe handling, et cetera, et cetera. And I came to realize because I was in a position to where this was happening almost every day. Small groups of us getting together after we right. would shoot, before we shoot, before a uh, group event or what have you. And just about every question that Maj has moderated here for us, I was getting two and three and four and five times right. in a day, <laughs> every day for weeks on end. So I said, you know what? I went to the president, I said, we have to systematically, corporately, address these concerns all the way to the granular level, all context, all nuance of all these issues, including the weed thing that's on the table now. 
and incorporate it in our new members orientation class where we talk about the tradition of arms in the black community. Well, wait, though, Mitch, let me, let me tell you, though. You talking about something to people that already kind of get it. You talking about distilling it to a space. But here's the thing. Now it has to be, it can't just, it can't be, it's very clinical. The way that you, because that's your background. But for somebody, even the stuff that you're saying, a lot of the youngins in my neighborhood will go, yeah, but how did that get to me? Like, because I'm in this 10 block radius. I'm saying, and, 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 and the reality is, when it comes back to the weed thing, we, we, that's what we miss most of the hood. We were, talking, we were talking about this the other day. In addition, I, I hate running down my pedigree and trying to have as little signature as possible. But I'm a graduate of Morehouse College, right in the street. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> in the interest of time, I'll, 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 I'll respond to that later. Um, but right up the street. Um, and as prestigious as an uh, institution as it is, We've had some issues with weed on campus, right? Mm -hmm. I've started a gun club on campus. So it had put me dead center. So when I said I'm fielding these kind of questions all the time, it's not just from behind the podium or on the range. It's because I am very active in our community, right. outside of the range. So I would be on campus, I would be in the hood, my fraternity, we do a lot of uh, mentoring and outreach. And as soon as those kids, those elementary school kids and high school kids find out that I'm in executive protection and that I'm a firearms instructor. They all come to me with all their questions. They're like, hey, my cousin got a piece like on him right now. Right. <laughs> what, what, what would she do? Like, what would she do? <laughs> you're not answering the question. But, 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 but my finer point is this. is over. <laughs> my, 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 my encapsulation is this we have to make sure we are meeting people where they are right if it's on the static range great if they're already receptive great if they're not that does not relinquish us from the duty and the responsibility to meet them where they are and give them what they need uh, I was up at Sig Academy only black person in the patrol rifle instructor class everybody else was SF SWAT you know Pipe swingers and good old boys. Right. And they had tons of questions for me that had nothing to do with actual marksmanship, dynamic shooting, whatever. We talked just like this. And because I was able to educate those brothers, and I call them my brothers, right. because I was able to educate those brothers to the tradition of arms in the black community, because I was able to say, black folks' relationship to the gun is not your relationship to the gun. I took them all the way back to 1607. When the first ships hit shore. Question. Real quick. Mm -hmm. Reddit. Where you at? Reddit. Reddit, your experience. Reddit is a fire. Well, he'll explain to y'all. Reddit's a firearm <coughs> instructor out of Florida, right? Reddit has had one of the I'm most. Yeah. It's, 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 okay. Uh, one of the most um, sobering and eye opening scenarios as far as, you know, you know, a situation, and I kind of want you to expound on that because your 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 life is, huh? It's him right there. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So I mean, and these are these are the part of the reasons why we have trainers and instructors that have, can walk that line. But I just kind of, as you said that, Mitch, I'm like, mm -hmm. that you popped in my head. You know what I'm saying? But just real quick, I, I really want y'all to you know get you know ready to start. Again, I'm Randy already, Jr. I'm the chief firearm instructor at Reddick Firearms Training in Broward County, Florida. I had a situation some six years, six, seven years ago as to where I went. I'm a Freemason, Prince Hall Mason, whatever you want to call it. We um, did some um, charity work one day. We marched in a parade. I uh, got in my truck after the parade to go home went to stop by the post office. I carry every day, all day. I was in the Masonic Regalia you would have been. So uh, I went to stop by the post office. As we all know, it's illegal to go in the post office with a firearm. I took my firearm off, sit in the console of my truck. Closed the truck, closed the fire uh, console, went into the post office, grabbed my mail, back in the truck, headed back home up 95. Got to use the bathroom. So now I'm in the gas a little bit. 
Uh, get home, run upstairs, jump out of the truck, mm -hmm. uh, lock the truck, go upstairs, throw the keys on the counter, back to my room, in the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom some two minutes. My baby girl runs in the house screaming and yelling. My baby son runs in the house. I shot my brother. Uh, I immediately get up, run downstairs to find my namesake on the ground with a bullet to the face. Uh, they, um, my sons were raised around guns. They know the whole don't touch guns, so on and so forth. But I say it and I say it over and over again, kids are kids, flat out. Mind you, they went, took the keys, went in the truck to get some out of the truck to find my gun, took the magazine out of the gun, but I always carried it around in the chain. Pointed the gun at his brother, pulled the trigger, killed him. And um, that's basically, that was basically the story. There was no backlash behind it. Um, it was a rude incident. And uh, from that point on, it actually um, induced me to uh, go and become an actual firearm instructor. And I actually preach, preach, preach firearm safety more than anything, more especially <laughs> children. Mm -hmm. That's him right there, by the way. That's my baby boy. Mm -hmm. You probably can't hear because he's got that damn <laughs> YouTube <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, I take him around with me and let him see what I'm doing. And, and let him know it wasn't the gun call. Mm -hmm of real life, this is my experience, and making that practical for our everyday life, it ain't no more everyday and practical than that. Your children, safety, and those types of things. You know what I mean? So his actual path that he's on is based on his real life experiences and bringing people from that. I mean, we, when we did the class, what was it? Was it Miami? Or, yeah, uh, Miami. In Miami. Having that ability to walk that line, to engage the community outside of the lane that you're in, to bring them in, is something that I think that all of us, you know, could like strive a little bit more on in that lane. Using our experiences, using, I was, you know, I played, I was, the, I'm the only, you know, white ball player now, so that's my perspective now, that, that, that paradigm shift. You know what I mean? And I think for us to move forward in that sense, we got it in whatever angle we talking about here, that question has to be on everything. Weed, okay, no, I, be, I believe that's a freedom. I might not even smoke, but my man might, so he should have the right to X, Y, Z, because, okay, liquor is legal and you can still, you know, Open. You can get a prescription at anything and still buy a firearm. Mm -hmm. You know, so all these things are, are you know are very practical. I want to. I think that's huge, though. I think that's a yeah. huge point that we use constantly, right? From the law enforcement perspective, alcohol does like six billion times more worse things to the yep. community than, than I've ever seen weed do. Yeah. And like I said, being in Colorado where it's around a lot, being in other places where it's around a lot, it, and this like that story gives me chills because that that to yeah. me is. Like, that's the worst of the worst, right? right. A, a, a person who is responsible with guns, who has a gun for the right reason, is trying to do the right thing. And maybe just, I, I don't know what the background was before that, but maybe nobody ever said, hey, seriously, trigger guard, seriously, holster, seriously, quick access safe, right? Put, put a gun ball under your truck seat, and now it's not just sitting in the console, it's actually locked up. And, and kids are kids, right? Say the same thing. Like, we do family firearm safety seminars. I don't care who you're, your 13 year old is going to go through your closet when you're not there. Your 13 year old is going to find your form, going to find your sex toys, going to find your weed, going to find your gun. Because he's a 13 year old. <laughs> right? Because there's a 13 year old. Because when you were 13, what did you do? Right. He's not at work. Right. I had my own gun dumpster that. But I was in my dad's closet out in the woods shooting his Colt Python right. that I wasn't supposed to touch because it was there. Right? right? The education, that story is an emotional story, but there's there's some facts and, and objective things behind it right. that is what needs to be educated. Right. So how many people in this room, myself included, right now back at your house have a kid and a gun that can come together, right? And that can happen, right? right? I mean, I know what the key, I promise you, my stepson, 13 years old, he knows how to find a key and put it in a lock and turn the lock and go in that room. Now, are there boundaries? Are there expectations? Absolutely. But it doesn't have to just be sitting in a console. Anybody can say, oh, well, you shouldn't have done that. Except how secure is your gun really right. from that 13 year old? Right. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the fact that and you're also, going we to don't, we don't live in a perfect world. You know, exactly. There's no amount of training or anything like that. Honestly, accidents happen in the world. We, we want to avoid it. We don't want it to happen. But, you know, so, anything could happen in the world we live in. So let's open the floor up for y'all perspectives, questions, all that other stuff. I want to say something to it. I've kind of been writing 
for a minute. Uh, and it was something that my brother right here, Mr. Morehouse, said. You know, <laughs> I mean, no, and, and it's real. But you know, uh, there's a perception for those of you who, who, who've never been to the inner cities of, of major cities or whatever. You know, you said something like you, you walked that line between being from the hood or being in the hood and what's right. You know, just because something is hood or it's from the inner city doesn't make it wrong. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that is the general perception. You know, yeah, there's bad shit that happens in the hood. There's bad shit that happens in the burbs too, though. You know what I mean? But we cannot go into things thinking because it's from the hood and because it's hood. Sometimes I hate the word hood and I hate the way it's used and I, whatever, but like it, it doesn't make it wrong. You know, and when you go into something like that thinking that we're already wrong, you right. can never I reach those people there. You can never reach, no, you can problem. never have, you can never, it can never work. Well, you we know what I mean? Well, see, we don't really say the hood. The hood. No, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about, yeah, right, saying right. Now, to, to give yeah. examples, just like we, you know, but, you know, it's one thing to be from somewhere because you were born there because your mother lived there. Right. Everybody that's from my neighborhood is not about the neighborhood. You that's what, what I'm saying. saying. Like that's, some people that's just can't afford to live nowhere else. That's, my that's point. like we, we right. look at certain people like some people that somebody else might say, Oh, he's from fifty fourth street, so he yeah, but that kid from fifty fourth street got a four point oh, he's da 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 he's not he's Absolutely. from the hood but he's not right a part of not a part not, not a part of the the, part the, of the, the right. you know what I'm saying? So you got different just like just like in the in the burbs, you know what I mean? Like I, where I live at now, like I got you know, when I first moved there it was the way my neighbors acted towards me. Now they I've been there a while and they play with my kid. You know, it's a different thing, but I remember when I first moved there. That's right. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, it's just like we all keep saying, education is the key. That is education. it. That is it's it. all about educating because, you know what I'm saying? Like, <clears throat> I learned a lot this morning. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and I could have been like, I used it. Like, you know, he's invited me to other stuff. And I'm like, ah, I ain't with this shit. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and no matter if the person is from the hood or of the hood, they're mm -hmm. deserving of whatever it is that you have to Absolutely. offer. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, that, that's what happens a lot. We argue, we've been conditioned, and that across any racial line, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've been conditioned to argue for, for things that are actually in opposition to our own freedom. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I, I totally so, agree with you. Mm -hmm. Laura. Um, one of the things I was going to say, you asked earlier, what was the, the solution? I'm not an instructor. I'm not, I'm, I'm a woman of a certain age who took an interest in a guy. I grew up in Freeport, New York. I was raised to be afraid of guns. Um, but I figured at some point I needed to learn, I needed to get educated. So I came to the last Black Guns Matter and I met Maj and a few other people and I started getting connected. I met people like Chris, people that were positive. We were talking earlier, Lola and I, about weeding out the bad and embracing the good. But I think the solution is being available. When I have a question, I call, I ask, what's going on, what's this, what's that? I think that you have to be available to dispel the myths prior to me starting. I wanted no part of a gun. Right. So I think it's an each one teach one. If you I brought two people with me, I've always telling people, I think if we repost, I think if we just make it available so people know information is out there, good people, right. you know, and then you'll be able to kind of use your um, not the common sense is always common. Spidey sense. Right, your spidey sense is to weed out some of the nonsense. But I think as long as people, groups like this, are available, the information gets out there. <coughs> Eventually, I, I think racism, things like that, are, are, are taught. You, you, you do it because it's what your dad did and what his dad did. And you're afraid to be the one in the room to say, you know, this is racist, call it out for what it is. But I think at some point, as long as it's available, people have to face certain things. People have to admit certain things are there, call it for what it is, and get themselves educated to get the knowledge. And I do think at some point it will turn. My mother told me, why don't you learn how to sew? Mm -hmm. Like, you, guns, you know, what's that about? But now she kind of like says, okay, I, I can see it. I, I can understand. And eventually I think the faces will change. And, and it can possibly change. But I think everybody has to be available for somebody else. Right, I agree. I also, Shanine, I kind of want you to jump in and just like kind of like express like, you know. So, I'm going to start just by telling everyone that don't know about my story, a little about it. Um, so I'm from Philly and I have two boys. The reason why I even went to get a firearm in the first place is because I got robbed twice in the same month. Not once, I was like, okay, you know, I got robbed, okay, took my purse. No, I got robbed two weeks after that, again, in Simba City. At the time, my son was going to night care, 
Um, I was working at a bar and I was also doing phlebotomy. So I was moving around, getting kids late at night and got robbed twice. From then on, I talked to a friend of mine and he's, he's in the army. And he was just like, you need to go and get your license carried. I was like, well, don't I gotta be a cop or something? I was clueless. Didn't know nothing about getting no firearms. Wasn't around any firearms a day in my life. It's just me and my kids. So he told me how to get the application process going, where to go. I went to get it. I had an interview in front of a police officer. They had to ask me all kinds of extensive questions about my life to make sure that I was an upstanding citizen to be able to get my license carried. Um, I paid $25 and they called me a month later. I came to pick it up, just a license. No paperwork, no nothing, just that's it. Walked out the door. My son's birthday was a week later. I had bought a firearm the next day. I spent $700 on this firearm. I made sure that the gun that I got had three safety locks on it. I said, I want the safest gun you got. I don't care, I don't know nothing about guns. Just give me the safest one. I had a two-year-old and a nine-year-old. So I had a person. I had three locks and a, and a safety key. I said, oh, okay, ain't nobody getting, you know, getting in there. Right? My son, I'm gonna to touch that firearm. So I bought it. The police officer that sold me the gun asked me which bullets did I want. I said, what's the difference? He said, these are $27 and these are $50 something dollars. I said, well, give me the cheap bullets because you bought a $700 gun. So little did I know, I didn't know those were how to bullets that I purchased. So I went back home. I went to go throw my three roll and he was trying to a birthday party in Jersey. So I put four bullets in the gun locked it, put it in the holster, put it in my purse, took the dog, took the cake, everything, put it in the car, and I was driving to Jersey and left my kids home to go set up and decorate the hotel room so that I can go to Philly the next day, pick them up, and bring them back to Jersey so I can have a surprise birthday party. One in the morning, I got pulled over by state troopers for no reason. Um, I asked him what I'm being stopped for. He told me to get my license and my uh, registration and I said, well, can you tell me why I'm being stopped? He said, just be quiet and give me what I need. He said, this is procedure. I said, okay. I went in the back seat of my car to get my purse, put it on my lap, and I was digging in there to go get my license, and then I felt my gun. And something just clicked in my head, like, just tell him that I got it on me, because he had that flashlight in my face, and I just felt like he was gonna see it, you know, and think I was a threat. It was like a quick thought. So I was just like, listen, I got my license carried and I have a firearm in my purse. And he's like, what? He's like, caught off guard. And I said, yeah, it's right here. He's like, where? I said, right here. So I grabbed the bottom of my purse to give it to him. And he's like, no, no, drop it, leave it, you know, let, let it go, drop everything. So I just dropped it and let it go because he pulled out at this time, snatched my purse out of the window, threw everything on the hood of my car, asked me to step out the car. At this point, I didn't think that I was about to be arrested for <clears> my gun. I thought this man planted something on me. I, I didn't know what was going on because I thought I was legal by me having a firearm. So when I stepped out the vehicle, he put cuffs on me, took me in the back, and I asked him, what am I being arrested for? He said, well, you have a gun, and I know you didn't know the law because you wouldn't have just told me, but you're, you were not supposed to transport it the way that you're transporting it. I said, so how am I supposed to transport it? Can you just tell me and we just get it over with and send it back home? She's like, no, I don't know exactly how to transport it. I know no, it's not like this. And so I just started tearing up. I'm like, how can I be in trouble for something that you don't even know what I'm in trouble for? So they took me in, handcuffed me. Not only did they handcuff me, but they shackled my feet. I didn't get that. To this day, I still don't get that. I was the only one in the station. There was no one else there. It was one in the morning. Left my dog on the side of the road, the cat, everything in the car, everything, the cake, everything. Um, locked me up for 48 days to stay prison. I wasn't in a regular cell, like in a police station. No, I was in state prison because it's Easter and I couldn't see a judge, and the judge I saw was on the TV screen. So when I saw this judge, he's like, I don't know what's, what's up or why Jersey wants you so bad, but you're gonna have to go upstate until they figure out what they wanna do with you. So when I got to jail, they told me I was detained. I had to wait about two and a half weeks to call my kids, or call someone to let them know that my kids are home by themselves. Um, someone, one of the police officers let me use my cell phone that was in custody. 
and call a friend of mine to tell them to go to my house and tell my kid's father that the kids are there by themselves, which we were not together. So um, I just prayed the Lord that he got to them, which when I got my first phone call, because it was overcrowded, and I was stuck in a room with 40 girls sleeping on the floor because there was no beds available. I had to just sit there and go through it and wait until they put me in population. Not only did I have to wait for population, but I had to get shots. I had to get TV shots and hep C, everything. Um, after they quarantined me and made sure that I wasn't disease infected and put me in population, um, I had to wait until whatever funds I got locked up with was available so I could be able to use that money to buy snacks or whatever I wanted to buy, commissary, is what they call it. Um, in jail, I learned what absconding is. I learned what even detained was. I didn't even know what detained meant. You know, I was in this prison system, so I didn't know anything about that. I didn't have a, uh, uh, I had a public defender who was pregnant at the time, but was very scared. I didn't know what to do. I had a judge that was very, very evil. He didn't hear my story that, at all. I didn't get a ticket for why I was pulled over. <laughs> never, never had to deal with that. But it took me to sit 48 days, which my bail was 50,000. Don't know why, no percentage, just straight cash. And um, by me sitting almost 50 days, it's at 50,000, set. Um, so when I got out of jail from sitting all the time, I still had to pay 1,500 towards the bell for the last two days that I didn't sit. Um, I said, I gotta tell somebody about this. And one of the girls that was a bunkie of mine, she was a prostitute. And she was like one of the best people I ever met because she gave me Evan's number. And Evan Evan was the attorney who helped my case in New Jersey. She said, I don't know what he can do, but I just have this number and it's all I got. So when I called him and told him that I was in jail and I didn't have a record, he didn't believe me. He's like, no, something got it. They had to arrest you for something else. So they ran my background check and everything and that's when I started to go public to tell someone, like I'm not crazy, did I just get locked up for getting a gun to protect myself that I never got to shoot, never got to use, never intended to use it, just wanted to protect myself and ended up in jail and my life was ruined. I lost my job because I was on TV. They called me on the phone and told me that not to come back. Um, I had to wait uh, a year. I had to go back and forth from Philadelphia to New Jersey uh, because I was on probation. And once I got on probation and I got part of my Governor Christie, it took a year to part and to the public defender and everyone to get caught up with them. I had to ride around with basically that deal for two years, saying that I was pardoned because the paperwork didn't catch up. Um, it took me two and a half years to get my firearm back. Um, and even to this day, which I thought, as of last week I just found out I'm still in the system. They said I was, and I was supposed to be expunged, and I just found out a week ago that it still pops up when you pull it up on an app, which is not supposed to be there. So I'm kind of still in, actively involved in this. I could have went back to my regular life and said, you know what, the, the, the system just failed me. I, I just wanted to work and just take care of my kids, and that's all I wanted to do. I don't want to be involved in no, nothing that has to do with guns or any people that deal with guns. But I'm standing up, and I'm trying to do something right for everyone, even women, because somebody got to do it. I was scared of firearm, and a lot of women are scared of firearms. And they're like, I don't want to touch a firearm or protect myself because I'm scared of them. No, I was scared too. But when your life is in danger, when are you gonna when are you gonna take that action? Now or later? Like right. have some kind of backup. Like get yourself involved. Right now, what I'm getting involved in, instead of like teaching people how to shoot guns, I don't wanna be responsible for someone else's life. I don't. But one thing that I am doing right now is trying to get this law passed. HR 38 for national reciprocity because that's what I thought my license was. I thought my license had reciprocity with every state, just like my driver's license. That's really what I thought. I thought this law was already out there when I crossed Jersey. But now that I'm actively out there and I'm actively speaking to these congressmen and legislators and letting them know this is my life, that's your life. This is what happened. This could happen to you. How long are you going to keep this going? Seven people and plus more had the same situation I had after me. That's, you know, it's just happening back to back. It has to be a change. For sure. So I'm here with, with Maj and, and anyone else. We're from the same city. Um, 
it's sad that I had, I had to go through this. Someone like me that never had to go through anything, never was in any trouble, maybe. The second time she got robbed was in Center City. And, and Center City is like, like that's like getting robbed in like uh, like by the World Trade Center in New York. That's like our Manhattan. So mm -hmm. that goes to show the perceptions of she wasn't somewhere she probably shouldn't have been. She was somewhere where the mayor's office is at. And, Every millionaire in the city has all, you know what I'm saying? She was in a very high end area where, you know, lost condos and she got robbed and wasn't able to protect herself that particular time. So that goes to show it's not just all about the hood. Right. You know what I'm saying? The opposite of the hood. Yeah. She wasn't in the hood when she got yeah. robbed. And, and I think it speaks to something bigger too that we didn't touch on today. Like a lot of reason people in the inner cities or in the hood don't deal with firearms is because they don't want to deal with the negative backlash from law enforcement. You know what I mean? Because let's be honest, we all know what happened to her, what happened to the brother Castillo in Minnesota. You know what I mean? And, 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 and many other American citizens who legally carry firearms every day. There is a major disconnect between a lot of law enforcement uh, agencies and the people that they service. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, and there has to be a conversation to have because it's just ridiculous. It's getting, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. I mean, I, I, like you said, I couldn't even believe, I mean, I believe you, you know what I'm saying? But I can't, I can't imagine that that would happen. You know what I mean? I can't imagine that somebody didn't stop before it got that far and say, wait a minute, hold the fuck up. Like, she was legitimate. You know, she made a boo-boo, slap her on her hand, let her go. You know what I mean? Nobody jumped in and said that. Well, I think so two weeks without your, no, like it, two yeah. weeks without her kids having a, having somebody at the crib. There's no common yeah. sense. It, it feels There's no like common sense at the law. No. Yeah. no common sense at the law. Especially no. right. but that's without. why it shouldn't exist. I mean, I think we should have conversations without mm -hmm. a doubt. But mm -hmm. the but the truth here, what the what, let's say that we have conversations and there's still people that exist that are racist, which you can't do anything about. Those people, if they want to hurt us or hurt anyone, they're going to use the law. The law should not exist to shield those people. Right. That's the first thing that shouldn't exist. Does it mean that if the law doesn't exist, that people are going to try to do those things? No, because she also said in there that police officer didn't even know the law. No, right. You know, right. And maybe that's even they, one they of the reasons why he didn't say to her, hey, why don't you just go about right. your business? Right. You know, because he didn't know, and now from not knowing, he, he fell into this situation you know, where he was like, well, I'm just going to arrest her. Right. And, le and then someone else decided right. to make an example of you or whatever happened there. So she ran into the, 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 the okay, we, that example is, it's close to an election year or an election year. Mm -hmm. We're tough on crime. Yeah. And that's not crime. You know what I'm saying? So, can I say something real quick? Yeah. From my situation, you know, we're talking a lot about racism, but you, there's also racism of what you per se might do for a living. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In my situation, because I worked in the music industry and I, dealt with a lot of you know rap artists, they threw the book at me. And yeah. I'm the one that got shot first. There was a loss of life, unfortunately, when I returned fire, but Giuliani and those boys in New York were like, nah, you know all you people are bad. Right. Yeah. And they put me through the system. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and it, it took a lot. You know what I'm saying? It took a lot. I was facing seven years for how I got shot through times that I'm facing seven years. And when I took it to trial, it was like you lose, you know you're gonna do fifteen to twenty. And, and, the, and you know, and I and I'm not gonna lie, you know, for a split second I really thought about doing the seven, like I'll do the seven, but I fought it, you know, and then three hundred thousand dollars later, you know, I'm here. And I'm not trying to plug in US Law Shield because I do work for Law Shield, but this is fifteen years after the fact. You know, when I moved to Florida and I went and I got a, a you know, a gun permit. Those laws or whatever, like that's something that when I became the state manager for Law Shield, that company is based in Houston, Texas. There's not too many people that look like me that work for US Law Shield. So I made it a point, you know, to reach out, to contact different people from corporate and be like, you know what? I want to start bringing something back to my community, right. you know? So one of the main things about US Law Shield, we're not a murder insurance, because first of all, we're not insurance, right. okay? Yeah. But we educate our members to make sure that if you would have been a US Law representative or member, we would have told you, like, listen, you can't cross the bridge. Right. You know, we will give you all the materials to tell you, like, listen. And as far as changing perception in the hood, it's like, I grew up in New York City. I don't know. What are y'all doing for us to know about it, though? Like, U.S. Law Shield, where is your billboards? Where is your social I'm media? You. Where is it? I'm going to tell you. The company is five years old, and that's why we're here. You know, we, we, we start to merge and be like, hey, listen, we got to come back. So here. as of now, there's nowhere, 
where we can visibly not not of, not as of yet, but this is you know this like, is the start. Look, look, gentlemen, he started. He was like, "What are we gonna do?" That's why I'm here. Absolutely. That's why we're here to educate <clears throat> as much people. And I can tell you that in the last seven months, I've been in Miami in the you know in the worst of the <clears throat> worst, telling people like, "Listen, everybody in Miami got a gun. You got a pulse. You got a half a brain. They give you a license, but you know what? Let's educate people because it's not that mm -hmm. simple." You know, this state, which is crazy to me, you just walk in and you pay a couple of dollars, they give you things. Nobody's educated in gun carry. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with the easily ability to purchase. Yeah, it should be. It should be. But see, but see, like you're saying, that's, you know, to your point and to your point, the point <coughs> of, okay, Shanine buys the firearm. Okay, now now what we, we wait, right. what, we did, what we did was we went, when we first started, we went to the, the licensing unit. They used to be across the street from where we did our, you know, our events. Right. We said, listen, can we at our cost make a list of firearms and instructors all throughout the city of Philadelphia? We're gonna pay for the we'll printing and we'll just make them here. You don't pick one, you just, whoever wants one, we'll leave them here. No. I'm gonna tell you why. I'm, I can only talk about Florida. That's the state that I'm, I live in at this moment. I think it's just systematically because they will give you your permit. It started at 125, 112, 102, 92 dollars. You know why I've never heard of a government agency that makes so much money that they give you a discount? It's systematically, because they hope and pray you don't shoot nobody, but they know that you're gonna cross the bridge. They know that you're gonna walk into the post office. They know that you're gonna go to the bar and oh, hey, let me get a water, and you got a firearm, and they're gonna lock you up. Because that way the whole system makes money. You know, everybody makes money. The judge, the lawyer, the so on, everybody makes money. And that's why they give you these permits. I'm not against, you know, people getting their permit. It is our freedom. Okay. The problem is that nobody educates nobody right. because had you, be, you know, be you didn't do that at all, but you crossed the bridge. So wait, wait, wait. I, I do, I do have to kind of jump in. Having been like on the other side of that, right? I don't think there's a, some kind of vast conspiracy to feed the system. I don't. I, don't, I think that may be, may be a step too far. And I understand that perception, but from from my side of that that situation, I think there's a lot of political issues. I, I wrote a uh, essay about this just earlier this week, this issue with national reciprocity. There's a lot of, there's a lot of hidden problems with national reciprocity. Agreed, federal government agreed, problems. agreed on that. I lobbied for, for HR 218, the law enforcement has a foot in the door, right, with the LEAA, and then we can get national reciprocity. But as, as again, as you learn more and you see more, there are problems in the system. I, I think one of the problems in the system is that we, as a gun community, pro-gun people, the leadership, NSSF, NRA, whoever, we love that political win of constitutional character. Now, I make my living, right, for the majority of the last 15 years selling training, selling education. I give away a lot of information free on the internet, do things like when I can. But that's my living. I don't want mandatory training. Right. I don't want the government saying you have to have this training. Right. Yeah. But, but what I want is for the gun community, the person that sold you that gun, sold you those bullets, mm -hmm. to be encouraging you right. in whatever way yeah. they can right. to be educated, at least be responsible. The, at least least put the information out there. That's all I'm But not mandated by the government. Uh, motorcycle gang. Uh, banditos and a couple other organizations. You know, we represent we, everybody. We, we, we don't care everybody. who you are or what you're doing. I'm not saying you don't care. Everybody has the same right. We, to the we will. Yeah. We, we will. Come to the mud. No, we will. We got we to do it, bro. We, we, I'm begging y'all to come through. I'm right. begging y'all. He'll tell you, I run my neighborhood. I don't mean like, I mean literally run it. Bring them through. They welcome to come through. I'll make the kids listen. But you got to come through. That's my town. I know everything's shaking. That's why I'm here. You know what I'm saying? I need to know about that because what y'all got is a great program. When he just said y'all got lawyers there, these kids have no clue. They're not all dumb. They're not all rebel. No, Some of them really want to learn. They don't know. And they're not going to come downtown. My eyes do a lot of shit downtown. That's cool. Like the sister said, Center City. It's kids that just don't go down. Right. 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 You know what I'm saying? Like you're not going to come. So if you bring it to them, make your friends to them. Bring it to them. I'll, I'll get y'all whatever y'all need. Y'all need a place like this. All right, wait, hold up, y'all, hold up, y'all, because I'm getting the, uh, I'm putting the TK on my blast, I'm getting the time text. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, and plus, I want everybody to eat, I want everybody to hang out again. All the, the actual events.